Video, audio, check, check. Okay, we're good. All right, so remember that there, there's more than one way to go about doing these problems. Um, the key here is to work straight down so that every line is equal to the one above and below. Going off to the side, if you need to do any calculations, like we're gonna encounter some fractions today and uh, a lot of y'all, as I've discovered, haven't been held to the standard of working with fractions in your head. So we're gonna do those off to the side um, and go, go little by little, right? One, one little step at a time. The first thing that you should realize though is this thing has a radical. And so anytime you see a radical in a problem like this, you're trying to simplify, I would say number one is, is always to rewrite your radicals as fractional exponents. Okay, because we, we, we think in terms of radicals, like the square root of four is, is two, uh, but when we're trying to simplify, it's better to have it as an exponent so we can utilize those rules of exponents, okay? So what I would recommend doing first then is to put the whole quantity like this to the what power? Not the tooth power, because that would be squared, one half. A lot of people say two, because you know there's a two involved, right? It's the square root. But just think about it. Is squaring something the same as square rooting it? No. So you're like, oh. So remember the roots grow underground. They're in the denominator, right? So all that to the one half power. Now I see a fraction inside, so I'm going to build a shelf. All right? You're going to put stuff on shelves. There's no reason why you can't do a little bit of work on the inside as you go from one line to the next, okay? Instead of just writing it all down, although you could. So our goal is to get rid of parentheses so we can start joining things together. So I'm gonna color code what I'm gonna do here. I see that I have a quantity to the fifth power. So that's two U times two U times two U five times. We can use the rule of exponents though that say we just distribute the exponent. So it's two to the fifth, we can write that down and not 10, right? If I was doing this uh, for a, a test or something, I would work it with a 10 instead of a two to the fifth because students know we have to multiply, there's no exponent showing, and they multiply the five and the two incorrectly. So uh, put little ones there as exponents to help yourself. And then you get u to the fifth, okay? So I could do that. That takes care of that red piece. Now, something else I could do as I go from one line to the next is combine uh, things from high to low or left to right. So I see there that I have factors, factors, which are multiplier divided, of V. And I can get those together using the rule. Now, when we use the rule, it always ends up in the numerator, okay? And the rule says to do what when you're dividing and the bases are the same? Subtract the exponent. So that's negative two minus three. That gives you negative five. That's just one way to do it. If you just wanted to bring the V to the negative second to the bottom and call it V squared, and then add it up to the three and call it V to the fifth in the bottom, I'm fine with that. I'm fine with that. I'm just utilizing the rule here. And then uh, what else is left? The stuff that's not highlighted. Let's see, I'll just do that in purple. That's still three U to the negative first, okay? So everything there is color coded. I did, I did really three things in one line, but neither one of them interfered with the other. And if you needed to do that in more steps, that's fine too. Okay, so now you're kind of at a crossroads. Uh, and as Yogi Berra says, when you get to a fork in the road, you wanna make sure you take it, okay? We can either work from the outside in or the inside out, and both methods work. The outside in approach would be now to take the one half and distribute it to every single one of the exponents. The inside out approach would be simplify as much as you can on the inside first, which means in this case, we can still combine those U's. So what do you want to do? I don't care, inside out or outside in? Inside out, good. That's what most people kind of prefer. That's what first three prefer. That's what I heard more, more of y'all saying. So uh, that could be your, your strategy. Just continue to work from the inside out until you have like one representative factor of each type. Okay, so two to the fifth, uh, what is that equal to? We could simplify that. 32, that's one that you should know. It'll show up quite a bit. Uh, let's do the u's next. I'm gonna have u to the five minus negative one, which becomes u to the sixth, okay? The common mistake there is just to say, hey, I know I have to subtract, so it's five minus one. Eh, it's convenient, there's already a minus sign there. No, you're subtracting a negative, so be, be, be very careful. And then we get v to the negative fifth, and then three is on the bottom. 
Now at this point, we're kind of done on the inside. 32 thirds does not simplify, does it? Okay, if it were 33 thirds, we could call it 11, but it's 32 thirds. So we essentially have one number and then one representative of each variable. Now we can get the one half involved. And so here's where I'm going to help myself. I'm gonna put little ones there. When I distribute the one half, I'm not gonna need the parentheses anymore. So that's gonna be 32 to the one half power. If I were making the test, what number might I call that for an answer choice that's wrong? What might students do, especially if they don't draw the little exponent of one there? When they distribute the one half, they know they have to multiply. What's half of 32? 16, I would put 16 there. Yeah, for an answer choice that is tempting, but wrong, okay? And then we get u to the six times a half is three, v to the negative five halves. Remember when you multiply fractions, you just multiply straight across. You don't need a common denominator. So off to the side here, I go negative five times one half. That's really negative five over one. You multiply straight across, so negative five over two, okay? And then we've got three to the one half in the bottom. Now at this point, you can be done. 32 to the one half, is 32 a perfect square? No, it does have a perfect square factor, right? Eight or four, sorry, um, 16 even. But uh, we, we, could, we could leave it like this, okay? So this would be one way that you could stop on a short answer, okay? Um, on a multiple choice though, I might go a little bit further than this. So let's just see what we could do. I could bring the V to the bottom and I could put that as the square root of 32, U cubed all over the square root of three. And then I could call that V to the five halves. What would that be in the bottom without the negative sign and without the fraction? If I bring the V to the negative five halves in the bottom, will it be the square root or the fifth root? It's still the square root, right? See the two's in the denominator? It's to the five halves. So in the denominator, that becomes the square root of V to the fifth, yeah. Okay, the square root of V to the fifth. So that's kind of what I want you to be able to do, to move from a negative fractional exponent to something without a negative or a fraction in one step. Try to force yourself. So that would be another place. This might be the multiple choice answer. Quentin, welcome. I'm recording the lesson so you can get it and put it in the canvas, which we're gonna go over right now. Okay, um, does anyone see anything else we could do? Just playing around with the answer at the end? Remember this little property, the square root of A times B is equal to the square root of A times the square root of B, does that work? Very good. These are both square roots down here. So we could put them together. That's the square root of 32 over u cubed. And we could say that's all over the square root of 3v to the fifth. I would consider that a little bit more simplified because remember, simplified means less stuff, right? And that's one fewer radical sign to write. If you really wanted to, you could now combine these two and say it's the square root of 32 over 3v to the fifth, and then times u cubed off to the side. That's how we would write that. I'm not a big fan of that version of it, okay? That just looks a little bit awkward. So if this were a multiple choice, I would probably go this far. But any of these would be good for your final answer on a short answer, okay? Because what we're trying to do is get one representative factor of each type. All right. Comments, questions on that one? All right, so let's quickly go through uh, some of the stuff on Canvas. There's three assignments out there right now, and uh, one of them is due on Thursday, and the other two are due on Friday, okay? So we need to make sure that we know which one's which. So let me share my screen here, uh, desktop. If we go to Canvas, we don't want that, Canvas. Just sharing my screen. Okay, so um, there's some duplications in there that I, I'm gonna try and do a better job of next time 
not doing because we we the three instructors uh, mrs lincoln mr hawk and i we all share content and sometimes uh, when you try to import something from another teacher it brings a lot of extra stuff in there and so uh, i'm still trying to figure that out but uh, if, if you just get in the habit of going to modules here there used to be a module that said class recordings and i was trying to streamline it but it didn't work and i couldn't figure out yesterday how to do it so i just removed that so if you ever if you ever gone or like Quentin comes in a little bit late, you missed the first example, the the notes or the videos for the notes are always going to be found under the notes, okay, in each of the units. So you can see 1.1 notes, and then the the three assignments are indented. The notes, by the way, is also an assignment. I'm going to have you all submit that as a PDF. That should be a free hundred. So uh, the video that I'm recording right now, uh, I will post it uh, here under the notes, and you can watch them directly inside Canvas, okay. And I'll date them as well with the examples that I go over. So if you're ever absent, that's where you'll find them. Uh, but back to the, to the assignments. The notes, you could probably submit at the end of class today because we're going to finish them. But there's a homework that's 1.1 multiple choice. And you take that directly in Canvas like a little quiz. I think you can come in and go out. There's no time limit. And the homework short answer. Okay. Uh, remember, the key is there. I post the key always with that. This is the one where I was talking about you can have different versions of the right answer. My key is just a guideline if you get stuck. Yes. You have a corrupt key? Uh-oh. Okay. Well, let me let me make a note and then I will try today during lunch to uncorrupt it. The key is corrupt. Dang. We must fight corruption. And I, I will look into that. So thank you. Yeah. Um, hopefully the, the file is not corrupt for the, for the actual assignment. Uh, and then you'll upload it there. And then the other one that I just added today or yesterday, this is the one that's due Thursday. The homeworks are due Friday. We have classes on A day and B day. And so I'm just going to make y'all's assignment due on B day. So that's fair with the other classes. So y'all have an extra day. But the quiz, since I only have A day classes, I'm gonna have you all do that ahead of time. So this one right here that says 1.1 quiz A, that's due Thursday by 8.50, okay? It'll be due by the start of class on Thursday. So it'll be due the next class day. So it's like a take home quiz. It's only eight questions and um, you submit that directly in Canvas. You take it in Canvas, you submit it in Canvas. So uh, I think I set the due date there, September 3rd. So it says it there. Uh, the other two are due on Friday, giving you an extra day on those. We don't see each other on Friday, but that gives you an extra day. If you turn them in on Thursday, that's great. Okay. Questions on those? Yes. Did I say 8 a.m.? It should say 8.50. Yeah. I'm going to make a note to myself to go back through and just check those, check the due dates. Um, again, I've been operating for years and years through my website. Canvas has some good qualities, but some some difficult qualities and, and definitely a little bit of a learning curve. So, uh, but I'll check on that. Thank you. That was Angeli. Yeah. Did you say that? Okay. Yes. Um, yes. Yes. The multiple choice is for accuracy. So make sure you're getting the right answer. We'll grade that on accurate. The short answer is completion. I'm glad you mentioned that. And then the quizzes will always be accuracy for sure. Okay. But they're all on time. Okay, I think Mrs. Skirhawk is going to have her dual credit class take the quizzes in class, you know, on their iPad and a time thing. So uh, that's dual credit. Y'all are just honors. So y'all, y'all take them as take home quizzes, essentially. All right. Good questions. Any other questions? Okay, sweet. Well, let's get back to then um, the notes. Let me share my iPad. We're going to encounter a lot of fractions and uh, based on what was happening last period, uh, I think we might have to spend a, a, another day or maybe I'll create an assignment uh, doing fractions. There's, there's a website that's free and I don't know if you've ever heard of it or used it. It's called Delta Math. And uh, it's, really, it's really good because it's free and they have really good question types. I've looked into it. So uh, we'll talk about that if, uh, eventually if I use that, but you'll just go in and create a, uh, a student account and then you'll sign up using a number that I give you kind of like AP classroom 
And I was looking at some of their fraction worksheets and I pulled it off of sixth grade math. So in sixth grade, you'll learn to combine fractions, right? Getting a common denominator and stuff. We're gonna be doing a lot of that today and uh, I'll teach you kind of how to do it. We'll do it off to the side. Maybe it'll ring a bell, but if you're like one of those people that are like, I just need more work with fractions, come in and see me in the morning. Someone in first period actually came in uh, right at eight o'clock this morning and said, I need more problems. And I was like, oof, not a good thing. She meant math problems. And so we went to the textbook and printed out a bunch of stuff for her and we had a pretty good little session. She felt better at the end. So if that's you with fractions, come see me, okay? We'll do what they call drill and kill, right? But you'll survive. Okay, um, here we go, next, next example. This is really kind of what we're working up towards, trying to do something like this. In Algebra 2, when you work with examples, you never looked at anything quite this big, okay? But at this level, um, we want to be able to tackle stuff like this. So it's really the same skills. And if you just have the mindset of like inch by inch, it's a cinch, we're gonna eat this elephant one bite at a time, you can do it, okay? So looking at this, I see one giant term with really two factor groups, the way they're grouped, right? The big parentheses to the negative third, and then the other thing times the two factor groups. Our goal is to eventually tear down walls, tear down brackets, parentheses, so we can combine like factors, numbers, and X's and Y's, something like that. So in the end, we should have a number to a power, an X to a power, and a Y to a power. What's the first thing that y'all see that y'all know y'all could do right off the bat? There you go, right? There was no number two, there's only a number one. If you see radicals, write them as fractional exponents, okay? Now, that's not the only thing you have to do on that line. So again, I'm gonna work straight down. Here's what I'm gonna do. Uh, let's not use red. Let's, I got some of these cool colors over here that I copied. Ooh, look at that. How about, how about, ooh, this is good. Kind of an aquamarine. I've got all of this to the negative third, okay? I'm gonna build the shell. I'm gonna focus on the fourth root. So it's gonna be that entire quantity to the what power instead of the fourth root. Quarter, good, one fourth power. And again, you can use the horizontal division bar, which is the obelisk, or the, you can use the slanted bar, right? The dash, the vinculum, the solidus, whatever you wanna call it, because it's only a four in the denominator. So inside there, we get y cubed x to the one half power. All right, times. Now I'm coming over here and I'm putting all of this quantity to the what power? If it's the cube root, it becomes the one third power. Yep. And then inside we got four X Y to the negative six. Okay, that felt good, right? Now in the numerator, I can, if I want, just rewrite what's there. But because it's kind of a separate little entity right now, it's not affected yet with the other stuff. I can see if there's anything yet I could do in there. Can we do anything up there? Very good. We have an X to the third and an X to the one half. So we can combine those factors kind of with our inside out approach. So it's gonna be a two and it's gonna be a Y to the negative second. What do we do with those exponents? Add, subtract, multiply, divide, or squish them together? Add them, good, right. So three plus a half is what? How many halves? We're not going to the calculator, fight the temptation. We don't go three plus one half because it just says 3.5. And we don't use decimal now, we use fractions. So seven halves, good. So here's how you do that real quickly. Here's behind the scenes, off to the side. Three plus one half, sixth grade math. You need a common denominator to add or subtract fractions. That's really three over one. The LCM, least common multiple, or LCD is two. So in your head, you're multiplying by two over two. That gives you six over two plus one over two, which of course is seven over two. So if you need to do that, notice where did I do that? Off to the side on my workbench. I don't do it underneath the problem and ruin the flow. It's off to the side. All right, so now the line that we started with is equivalent to the line below it. That was a good first step. All right, so now we box it and go on to the next problem, right? Looks good to me, right? I'm fine with it. No, I gotta keep going, right? See you, right? Take a little break, you know? Breaks over, pat yourself on the back. Feels good. Hey, just realize that man cannot propel himself forward by patting himself on the back, okay? All right, think about that for a minute. What next? Well, again, you can either do inside-out approach or outside-in approach. I'm gonna stick with the inside-out approach. 
So if you look at this first factor group, it's still all to the negative third. I'm going to leave the negative third out there. And notice when I write this down, how I do it, the sequence of how I do it, I have a blob to the negative third and I write that first. And then I build the shelf. There's really nothing I can do in the numerator. I've already done some stuff. Um, so I'm just going to rewrite it. X to the seven halves, Y to the negative tooth power. But in the bottom now, I can do what with the one fourth? Distribute. And that'll allow me to get rid of another layer of parentheses. So it becomes Y to the three fourths and X to the what? One half times one fourth. One eighth, right. Remember to multiply fractions, you just multiply straight across. And so the three is really three over one times one over four, and then one over two times one over four. All right, and then uh, over here on the next one, is there anything I can do? I could distribute. So what do I get when I distribute the one third to the four? Four to the one third, good. I don't get four thirds, I get four raised to the one third. So again, what I was saying earlier is you can put little ones here as exponents to give yourself a target. And now we get X to the one third, Y to the, well, yeah, it, see nothing's written there. So again, off to the side, it's negative six times one third. It's real easy to make a careless mistake. Negative six over what? One, right? Now you multiply straight across and you get negative six over three, which is negative two, okay? Negative two. Now at this point, you really don't need those parentheses. If you want to, you could put it over one. That would be an option as well, so that it kind of looks like the first factor group, right? It's like, no fair, he's got bunk beds. I want bunk beds. Put it over one. Now it's in the top bunk. Okay, still looking at that first factor group to the negative third. Again, you're at a fork in the road. You can either distribute to negative three to all five factors, three in the top, two in the bottom, or we could still do the inside out approach. I've got some X's that I can combine inside and I've got some Y's that I can combine on the inside. So you wanna do inside out? Okay, let's keep doing that. So blob to the negative third, build the shelf. Now, when we use the rule of exponents, since we're dividing, what do we do with the exponents? We subtract. And when we do that, everything ends up in the numerator. So let's do the x's first. I'll come off to the left side here. I've got multiple workbenches. I do seven halves and then minus one eighth. Now, if you do that little crisscross applesauce butterfly multiply thing here that I showed you, it'll work. It'll give you a common denominator but not the least common denominator. It'll give you 16. So if you do that, you'll just simplify your fraction. Or you could just tell yourself, what is the LCM between two and eight? Two is the GCF, the greatest common factor, but the least common denominator or least common multiple is eight, right? So you would just need to multiply this one by four over four. And so now you could do that in your head eventually. So you'll have 28 minus one, which is 27 eighths, yeah. Again, off to the side, show as many steps as you need to get it right. So that's your new exponent, 27 eighths. Now I'm gonna write that with a dash just because it's, it's getting hard to write layers, but the dash works because it's only an eight in the bottom. 27 eighths, if you got that number in like algebra two, you might think you did it incorrectly because you never really encountered quite the variety of fractions. Well, there's a whole world of fractions out there just waiting to be discovered, yes. Oh, yeah, no, that's, that's a good, good thing. Uh, we want to make sure we do top minus bottom. So it actually, it actually is positive. Yes, sir, more books. Who? Lynette. Lynette? Do we have Lynette? I don't, I don't recognize the name, sorry. Still learning. Okay, okay, okay. And Aubrey? All right, so Lynette, good, good luck finding Lynette. I know you can do the job. Thank you, sir. We're so appreciative. Okay. I know. <laughs> okay, um, so 27 eighths, yay. Uh, as I was saying, there's, there's so many fractions out there waiting for you to discover them. 
just like there's so many animals at animal shelters out there waiting for you to adopt them. Okay, yeah, same thing. Okay, yeah, I like dogs. And then we get y to the, let's see, can we do this one in our head? Negative two minus three fourths? Well, I, we better not. Let's go off to the side. Negative two minus three fourths. Now, when you have whole numbers, it's actually pretty easy because you just need to get the common denominator of the one that has the fraction, which is four. So if you multiply the negative two by four over four, put it over one if you need to, now you're left with negative eight, yes? So negative eight minus three is negative 11 fourths. Try it in your head, can't do it, go off to the side. So we get negative 11 fourths. Another great fraction. These are like the mutts of fractions, right? But mutts are cute too. They don't have to be purebred integers. Um, and then what's in the denominator? Just put one, yeah. Or you could drop the denominator because when you use the rules, everything ends up in the top. Okay, um, that second factor, he's like patiently waiting, right? He's still four to the one third, X to the one third, Y to the negative second, still over one. Like hurry up, dude. Almost there. Now to eliminate the last set of parentheses, we do all the negative three. Distribute, okay. So what do I get when I distribute the negative three to the two? What do I get? Two to the third, negative eight, negative six. Well, remember, look at this. Ooh, all the colors. Two to the first. We multiply the x, so we get two to the negative third, right? That we know, we get two to the negative third. Remember two to the negative third off to the side is the same as two to the negative third over one. Negative numbers are fractions in disguise. So it's not equal to negative eight, but rather equal to one eighth, okay? Negative eight is kind of like your, your knee jerk reaction, right? You know it's cued, but the negative does not make the number negative. It makes it smaller, makes it a fraction. All right, so remember negative numbers, if we come up here, negative numbers are fractions in disguise and vice versa, okay? Fractional exponents are radicals in disguise. So we can call that two to the negative third and then X to the, holy Toledo, negative three times 27 eighths? Ugh, what's 27 times three? Well, I don't know. I'm gonna go to my workbench, look at this. 27 times three. Is it okay to go off to the side and do old school stack multiplication? Yeah, it feels pretty cool. Nostalgic, right? You get a 21, carry the two, you get an eight. You get 81. Okay, so that becomes negative 81 eighths. That's awesome. Beautiful mud, right? And then the next one, a negative times a negative is a positive, so we get positive 33 fourths. And now we don't need the parentheses and we certainly don't need it over one, do we? Because we've expanded out. And so on the other one now, we can write it as, I'm gonna leave a space here, x to the one third, y to the negative second. Now let's look at four to the one third. That's the same as the cube root of four. Is that a nice number? Is four a perfect cube? No. So I can leave it as the cube root of four, but if I wanna combine it with the two possibly, can I write four as a power of two? Yes, we actually did that, I think on day one. So let's come off to the side and just focus on this piece because I want to rewrite four to the one third. Four to the one third off to the side is the same as blob to the one third, right? But in place of four, I'm gonna put two squared. Is that legal? Yeah, because two squared is four. And now what does that become? That becomes two to the what power? When we raise a power to a power, we multiply. So what's two times one third? Yeah, two thirds. It's two over one times one over three. We multiply straight across, right? So it's two to the two thirds. I'm gonna do that. Now, if this were like a short answer, you wouldn't have to do that. I would probably take the answer in terms of four and two. But as a multiple choice question, this is where I would force you to go. Okay, you have to match it up to the right answer, not just a right answer. Okay, so everything again is equivalent to the line above and below. 
Now we're ready to start getting things together, aren't we? Walls are down. One term, we can combine like factors. So let's do that. Let's do the numbers first, okay? Since they're both powers of two, that becomes two to the, and then I do what with their exponents? I add them. Negative three plus two thirds. Here's what you do. Since I'm trying to get two thirds, I need thirds. So I multiply the negative three by three over three. And I get negative nine thirds. Would you agree that negative three is the same as negative nine thirds? So now negative nine plus two is negative seven thirds. Okay. Does anyone need to see that off to the side? Okay, you don't have to admit it. I'll do it in slow motion. Here we go. Negative three plus two thirds. That's negative three over one. So I need a common denominator. So I multiply by three over three, which is one. Then I get negative nine thirds plus two thirds, which is negative seven thirds. And then I bring it back into the project. But again, force yourself to try to do it in your head without a calculator. You are the calculator. All right, let's do the X's now. I have powers of X that I can combine, so it's X to the, oh boy, negative 81 eighths plus one third. Dang. Let's do that one off to the side because that one is not as straightforward as the other ones. Negative 81 eighths plus two, uh, one third, sorry. Now, in this case, the crisscross applesauce would be a bad way to go because what's the LCM of eight and three? 24, their product. And so the crisscross applesauce works well. So let's do that. You get negative 81 times three, which is negative 243, plus you take the middle sign, eight times one is eight, all over the product, eight times three is 24. Or you could multiply the first one by three over three and the second one by eight over eight. Now, negative 243 plus 8 is negative 235 all over 24. Man, that's like a cross between a Great Dane and a St. Bernard, right? It's big and ugly, but still adorably cute, right? Yeah, faithful, obedient, playful dog, mutt. Negative 235, 24. Okay, that's the new exponent. Negative 235, 24. Go, go, gadget, math. All right. And then the last thing we do here is um, the y's. Look at this. Y and y. So it's going to be y to the. On your own, get the new exponent. Okay? Combine those exponents. I'm going to do it as well, but I'm not going to write it down. I'm going to do it in my head, or I'm going to try to. Go. Hopefully you're not seeking like the Titanic. Or if so, you're surviving and finding yourself. Did y'all get 25 fourths? That's what I got. I'm hoping that's right. 33 fourths minus two. Two is the same as negative or as eight fourths. So 33 minus eight is 25 and it's positive. Okay, now if this were a short answer, I'll just put an asterisk here. You could stop. Uh, and I'm just going to call it free response. It's the same thing as short answer, but I can abbreviate FR. That's uh, college board terminology. FRQ, right, free response question. So if this were an FR or an FRQ, you could stop right there. You have a number raised to a power, an X raised to a power, a Y raised to a power. But as you're doing the worksheet, I would like you to be able to practice because on a multiple choice, I would not put that as the answer choice. So let's practice getting rid of the negative exponents and let's practice getting rid of the, the fractions as well. So if you see negative exponents, you get rid of those first, right? Because you actually read it like that. Two raised to the negative. Okay, that's what I read. So let's put this over one. 
by putting it over one, you now see the layers, right? You got the top and the bottom. And you can move factors that are multiplier or divided from high to low or low to high as long as you change the sign of their exponent. So on the next line, we're going to have the shelf. And in the bottom, I have 2 to the 7 thirds, x to the 235 20 fourths, and then y to the 25 fourths stays in the numerator. That, that's another acceptable answer on a short answer or a free response. Okay. But now let's get rid of the radicals. Okay. So in the numerator, you'll have the fourth root of y to the 25th all over the cube root of 2 to the 7th times the 24th root, yikes, of x to the 235th. Now, if you can go straight from that line to this line, that would be a good thing. In other words, can you get rid of a negative exponent and a fractional exponent in the same step? I would be happy if you could do that because that does require a little extra mental agility, the level I want you all to be at. But I showed the intermediate step there, getting rid of the negative first, and that's fine. Okay, so when in doubt, whether to leave it out or show it, when in doubt, don't leave it out. Okay, show the step. It prevents you from making a careless mistake. And remember, it's, it's communicating your result as well. And then all of this little stuff around the margins, that's just your little bench work, your, your scratch work. It's decorations. But the project is in the middle, okay? Inch by inch, it's a cinch, right? Piece of cake. Piece of cake. Comments or questions on that? There's one more thing we could do. Let's say it's a multiple choice question. Since 2 to the 7th is actually a number, what is 2 to the 7th? One twenty-eight. Yeah, I generally start with two to the fifth because that shows up a lot. Two to the fifth is thirty-two, and we need two more factors. So double it, you get sixty-four. You double it, you get one twenty-eight. So I could call that the cube root of one twenty-eight. Okay, I'm not going to write that, but if there were a test question, that's that's what I would do. Okay. All right. Any comments or questions on that? Y'all like that one? Any like? Nah, that's a that's an acquired taste, sir. Not 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 really delectable to my palate yet. It is an acquired taste. When I first tasted coffee, I hated it. I hated it. I hated it. It was disgusting. Second time I tasted coffee, I hated it. Like the first 10 times I drank coffee, I hated it. And then I got to college and it was kind of fun to like pool all nighters. And my roommate was a big coffee drinker. So I started drinking coffee and I and then I, I acquired the taste for it. And now now I can't function without it. I'm addicted to caffeine and coffee. Okay. But a lot of people who do math are. In fact, the famous mathematician, Paul Erdish, Paul Erdish, check out this last name. You pronounce that Erdish. Paul Erdish was, uh, he's one of the most prolific mathematicians ever to, to uh, collaborate with people on, on novel math and public, publish, uh, publishing the results. Uh, he said that a mathematician is nothing more than a machine that turns coffee into theorems. So, ha, 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 ha. <laughs> Funny guy too, that Paul, right? Anyway, have you heard of like the seven, six degrees of Kevin Bacon? The, the game where you can always relate any actor to Kevin Bacon within six moves or six degrees of separation. That's kind of where it came from. That every human is, is within six uh, generations of, of any other person. No, you haven't heard that? There, there's something called an Erdish number too. Geeky mathematicians claim an Erdish number, which is, how close are you to someone who published a paper who published a paper with Erdish? So like if you published a paper with Erdish, your, your Erdish number is one and you're like, you're, you're like a Mac daddy. But if you published a paper with someone who published a paper with another person who published a paper with Erdish, now your Erdish number is three and you're just kind of okay. Um, I don't know what my Erdish number is, but it's, it's a really big number, right? It's like when I play golf, it's a really big number. In this case, low numbers are desirable, so whatever. Okay. Um, I forgot where I was going, but Paul Erdish, you can look him up. Okay. Um, he was a traveling mathematician, by the way. He, he had very few possessions. He just wandered to university to university, and they took him in and fed him, and then he, he dabbled on the chalkboard and published, and then went to another university. What a way to live. 
Okay, um, let's look at this table right here. It's good to know what to do, but it's also good to see things that are, that are not what you're supposed to do. How are we doing on time? We got an hour, okay. Let's get through this table and then we'll stand up and take a break, huh? All right, all right. Ugh. All of the things in this left column work. You can actually do them. And it's because they are factors, okay? Which means multiplied or divided. These work. A, B quantity squared is A squared, B squared, okay? That works. The square root of A, B is the square root of A times the square root of B. Remember, these things work left to right as well as right to left. A squared times B squared, square root of, that's just A, B. This is a kind of a neat one. One over A, B, the product, is one over A times one over B, okay? We're used to like going this way, right? Multiplying fractions, one times one is one, A times B is A, B. But there are times where we want to go the other way and split it up. So you can split up factors. Here's another one that I'll add off to the side that we'll see, like x over 5, for instance. That's the same as 1 fifth times x off to the side. Y'all may know that, but you can kick factors out of the numerator. But get out of here. And when you do that, they go off to the side. And that makes it look more like a number, a coefficient times a variable. Um, how about this one? We talked about this one, I think, day one. A times B divided by A. What happens with the A's? What can you do? They, thank you. Yes, good. They divide out, and that's new terminology for you, because things divide out to give you one. Things cancel out to give you zero. So we're working on getting the other teachers at little school and lower levels to say divide out and to teach PEMDAS correctly. Um, and then same thing here, AB quantity inverse, we call that, reciprocal, is A to the inverse, B inverse, okay? All right, so those all work. Here are things that do not work. These do not work, and it's because these are not factors, but rather these are terms. They are either added or subtracted. They do not work. Now, the first one is one that I know many people in here have probably tried, and you don't even have to raise your hand and admit it, okay? A plus B, not A times B, A plus B quantity squared is not A squared plus B squared. It's not. And your algebra teacher might have had fits trying to get you to realize that. Here's an example. Let's come up here. If you have to go like X plus, uh, let's do five quantity squared, your instinct would be to say, oh, that's X squared plus five squared, which is 25. And that would be incorrect. Okay? Because there's a middle term that is missing. So your teacher probably told you, you have to write them side by side and foil it, right? First outer, inner, last. And that still works. But a binomial squared, you could also do it this way, okay? Here's a little ditty that you can uh, remember. Square, let me put it in quotes because it's a ditty. Square, multiplied, double, square. It's not a very memorable ditty, but if you say it enough times, it works. Square, multiply double, square. Square, multiply double square. Square, multiply double square. Square, multiply double square. Square, multiply double square. Guess who taught this to me? Not Paul Erdish. If he did, my, my Erdish number would be one. Um, my pre-cal teacher here on this campus, Mrs. Birdwell, back in 1991. Whoa. <laughs> So anyway, if you're watching this video, Ms. Birdwell, and I know you, you tune into my videos, thank you. Square multiplied double square. I believe she taught it to Marcus as well, Etheridge. I believe he came through. So there are a couple of people in here who know this. Um, what does that mean, square multiplied double square? Well, to get the binomial squared, you square the first. That's x. So x becomes squared. To get the middle term that's missing, you multiply these two together inside and then double it. So x times 5 is 5x. What do you get when you double it? 10x. So it's plus 10x. And that doesn't really show up there, does it? Let's see, so plus 10x. Oh, look, I'm writing in relief. And then square the last. 5 squared is 25. Okay? Square, multiply, double square. We'll, we'll be doing that a lot this year. Take calculus. I'll be doing it a lot. Okay? So that's what it's equal to. It's not equal to a squared plus b squared. Same thing. The square root of a plus b can't split it up. It's not square root of A plus square root of B. It does not work, okay? Because those are terms, not factors. Same thing on the next one. A squared plus B squared under the radical, even if they're perfect squares staring at you, K 
can't take the square root of each and add them together. It does not work, okay? The next one is a, is a common mistake that people try to pull off. You cannot split up denominators, okay? One over the quantity A plus B is not one over A plus one over B. And sometimes people try to pull that off in, in desperation. But I will tell you this, these rules don't, do not work in direct proportion to your level of desperation. They don't work at all, okay? So don't do it. You can't split up denominators. Now you can split up numerators, okay? The next one is another common mistake. This is probably the one that most students make most often. A plus B divided by A. Students go, ooh, ooh, ooh. Divide out. I didn't say cancel, Mr. Corp. I said divide out. I'm like, great, but that doesn't work. Okay, doesn't equal B. Why not? Because A in the top is not a factor, but rather a what? Term. And you cannot divide out terms. You can only divide out common fa -fa 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 factors. Factors are multiplied or divided. So that doesn't work. So don't do that. No, 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 no. Now, what you can do, here's something you can do, and this is a strategy sometimes. You could say it's A over A plus B over A. That works. Okay. It's like getting a common denominator in reverse, right? You could split up terms in the numerator, and then that becomes one plus B over A. So there might be times where we want to do that. We want to split up the numerators. Can't split up denominators, but we can the numerators. And then the last one here, A plus B inverse is not A inverse plus B inverse. They don't work. So in general, just realize if they're added or subtracted, you got to be extra careful. If they're multiplied or divided, maybe like Zorro, divide things out. Okay, uh, it's 10.43, we got, uh, not quite, we don't have, we, under an hour, guys, 57 minutes, 57 minutes. Oh, no, 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 less than that, 52 minutes, sorry. Time flies when you're doing math, have you noticed? Or having fun, is that the same thing, right? Yeah, okay, I'm gonna stretch, oh, stretch, stretch. Who discovered the Titanic wreckage? James Cameron eventually did, right? He probably wasn't the first. But then he made that movie. What was it called? Was the ship? Titanic. It was called Titanic, also. I think. Um, are you in the Warrior Poets Society? I am. Did you recite some for us? A little snap break? No, no, but is there a poem that you recite? There's not even a poem. Oh, um, what is this? It's a. Uh, I mean, you can look it up. Okay, all right. Is there a secret? You want to tell me? Do you have a secret handshake? No. No. Okay. But, is, but poetry is involved somehow? It's just. It's the name of the cult. It's a cult. Okay, well, that's what I was thinking. I was, I was wondering if I need to refer you to ROTC or something. Colonel House can set you straight. Yeah, I know. I know. Is he in there too? Is he the leader? No? Okay. Okay. Oh, okay. All right. And we're back. Just just a little break, you know, just a little break. Um okay. Let's uh let's move on to example five. A counter example, okay, is not necessarily something that you would look at when you're like in a, a home furnishing store trying to pick out, you know, countertops. Like, ooh, this is a nice counter example. Let's put this in our kitchen, right? This is one word, counter example. In this case, counter means against. It goes against something. So a counter example is nothing more than an example that disproves something or it shows something to be false. So in mathematics, you can find many, many values that work in an expression, but that doesn't make it true. You can have a list of like, Millions upon millions of values that work when you plug it in, but that doesn't mean it's true. A proof is a very, very hard thing to do mathematically. However, it only takes one example to show something's false. Just one, that's it, that's all it takes. And it's called a counterexample. So in mathematics, if it's not true all of the time, we say it's not true at all, okay? And all it takes is one counterexample to shatter someone's claim, right? You may have a friend like that who's a walking counterexample. Every time you have hope, like, hey, I think I'm gonna try that. No, no, you can't do that because of this, right? They're a counterexample. They, they prove everything you wanna do wrong. Maybe you're a good friend and that's the only reason you're friends with them because they need a friend. But uh, anyway, 
Let's, let's go ahead and do this. Provide a counter example. A plus B quantity squared is not equal to A squared plus B squared. It's not. We showed that up above, right? We have to square multiply double square and some people miss the middle term. So to provide a counter example, here's what we do. First of all, we draw a line down the middle. And we're gonna do this later on, we do proofs as well, trig proofs. We're gonna evaluate both sides separately and, and compare the two values that we get. But we do have to state which values we're gonna use. So come off to the side and we'll say, let A equals zero and B equals one. I just pick random numbers. So you're like declaring that. Let A equals zero and B equals one, okay? So if you plug it in now, on the left side, you're gonna get zero plus one squared. And if you evaluate that now with your Aunt Sally's rules, zero plus one is one. So you get one squared and you get one. Sweet, that was easy. Well, now you plug it in on the other side. That becomes zero squared plus one squared. Well, zero squared is zero, one squared is one, zero plus one is one. Hey, it worked. I guess this is a true statement, huh? I don't know what I was saying earlier. I'm sorry, guys. That square multiply double square, I think, I think it doesn't work. What's wrong? Well, we, we did both sides and it both came out to be one. But remember what I said, there could be many, many, many values that work. But if something is not true, it only takes one to show that it doesn't. So I'm telling you that this doesn't work. If you happen to choose values and it comes out that it works, then you just need to choose different values because there might be times when it does work. So let's just, let's not erase this. Let's just lasso it with scissors like the Cowboys used to do in the Wild West, right? Lasso with scissors. And we'll just choose different examples. I just put it over here. I put it like in a space bag, you know, like you put your sweaters in a space bag and suck the air out of it and put it on your bed. It's still there, but it's shrunk. It's in a space bag, right? And if we need, if we need to open it back up, we can. It's getting a little chilly outside. We need those sweaters, don't we? Nope, today's supposed to reach 113 on the heat index and an actual temperature of 103. So let's keep those sweaters under the bed. You don't want to erase things because what you've done is you, you've, you've, you have an example of something that doesn't work, okay? So let's use different values. How about A equals what? Throw one out. Two and then B equals five. Okay, those are the first two I heard. Two and five. So now we'll draw a line down to Mitter and we plug it in. So, to, oh, let, sorry. Let, right? That, that gives uh, permission, okay? So now we have two plus five quantity squared. Using your Aunt Sally's rules, two plus five is seven, that's seven squared, seven squared is 49. Nice, 49, okay. And on the other side, we get two squared plus five squared. That's four plus 25, which is 49. No, it's 29. And now you use your keen powers of observation. You look at those two numbers and you ask yourself, self, are those the same? Oh, they're very similar, right? They both have nines. And you're like, is that how you make your nines all the time, Mr. Corpy? Yes, yes, I make them like this, okay? I don't know, I make my nines like that. It's kind of a decorative thing. I also make my sevens like this because I, I was raised in the Rio Grande Valley, seven miles from the Mexican border. And why do we make our sevens like that? Because our ones were like this. And so to distinguish between a one and a seven, we drew a line through it. I evolved and I don't make my ones like that anymore, but I still make my sevens like that just because I like to cling to the past. Okay. 49 is unequal to 29. So I think I showed you on day one, we draw this symbol. The two ramming arrows, like two rams going at it. Boom, what does that mean? It's like the Titanic hitting the iceberg. Boom. Oh, so it's a sad story. Contradiction. Contradiction. It means not true. So there you go. You successfully found some numbers that don't work. And that means even though it might work for some numbers, it's not a true statement. It's not an identity. We call that an identity. If, if it is an identity, and like this, this is an identity up here. Those are true for all values. Those become like mathematical synonyms. You can replace one expression with the other expression and you don't lose any information, okay? This is not an identity, it doesn't work. So don't ever try it again, okay? Or if you do, just make sure you do it in the privacy of your own home.
I don't want to see it. Okay, it's none of my business. Comments, questions, quote, quips, concerns, good, clean jokes, anything? Does right. anyone know any Titanic jokes? Or is it? That's not nice to do that. So. Okay. What, what, like what? Oh, you want to show us? Why you're pulling it up? Yeah. You know that the people, the the people, the musicians played music on the deck of the Titanic as it went down. They accepted their fate, and they wanted to go down doing what they loved and maybe bring a little joy to other people. Uh, and that made the movie. But what what didn't make the movie is there were also people in other parts of the ship that, for the exact same reason, remained in their cabin doing math. Just FYI. <laughs> I'm smiling under the mask. Did, did you find it yet? Okay, okay. Um, all right. That's that's the end of this section. That's the end of this section. Okay. So normally when we finish, especially with this one's time, we will we would roll right into the next section. Right into it. Okay. Any questions? Okay, let's download uh 1.2. But because we're still trying to shake off the rust of a five-month quarantine, or what was a five-month summer break, I guess, we're going we're gonna to start slow, and I'm going to give you all the rest of the period today to work on. I would start on that quiz, because that quiz is due Thursday. And then the, the two that say HW homework, uh, the multiple choice, and the free response. Okay? Um, any comments or questions on anything else? Yes, if you have completed the notes, you can submit it. Now, I'm glad you brought that up. When you submitted it or someone last period submitted it, there was like two of them. And this is what I'm talking about. Like sometimes they're duplicates. And I need to figure out why that's happening. Um, just submit it to the first one, okay? If, if the assignment shows up more than once, submit it to the first one. And I need to see what it looks like on my end because I've never – I've never received an assignment through Canvas. I'm supposing it goes to like a little mailbox that says Mr. Corpy's homework assignments. Um, and I'll find it. And then on the next assignment, I'll figure out why there's duplicates and everyone will be going to the same thing, okay? There's two of them for each one? Okay, okay. See, I need to figure out why it's doubled. So just send it to the first one. Yeah. And uh, next time, see, I'm learning too. I'm learning too. All right, any other comments or questions? We're done with the recording. All right.